So, our next speaker is uh, Ulrich Landebar, and it will talk about programming reconfigurable device. Let's upload it. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to have a short talk about um, using reprogrammable devices or reconfigurable devices, uh, namely FPGAs um, within Linux-based systems. Um, we use the uh, recently mainline ported um, FPGA framework that has been written by Alan Tal that is working for Intel. And I think last year on the FOSTEM there was al already a speech about that. Uh, a talk that uh, was a, lo a longer one, but uh, sadly that is lost, so the video is not present anymore. Um, so why we came across this, this, um, this topic is uh, we implemented a system that uh, accelerates uh, cryptography engines by, um, that's the traditional one, the software driver running on the CPU, and we moved that into an FPGA here, and um, that's basically what we did. We needed some uh, more subsystems. That's the hardware driver that talks to the AES hardware engine via DMA. And that actually integrates that into the crypto, F crypto, FP uh, crypto API within the Linux kernel. That leverages the um, accelerator, the hardware functionality, and exposes it to all system portions that want to, to use it. So that could be user space tools, the same as um, kernel space tools, because all of them can talk to the crypto API. And this way, we have a very flexible interface to our new hardware. <coughs> then as cryptography algorithms advance and uh, the systems change, you also want to be able to change the um, baseline cryptography algorithm. That's why we use uh, a reconfigurable system so we can swap out the old algorithm and swap in a new algorithm or move more of them, whatever. And uh, for doing that, we use the uh, Linux kernel FPGA framework. And that's shown here. We have the, uh, the internals of this um, framework shown here in the uh, slightly darker blue than the other one. And uh, that handles all the FPGA specific parts. And um, the user actually influences what happens via device tree overlays. I come back to that in the next slide. And um, you obviously need some drivers that interact with the physical device. And that's those ones here that are specific to whatever FPGA device you use. In our case, this was a multiple system um, on chip um, type of platform. So we have those CPUs, actually it was two, and the FPGA pie, a part on one single chip. But other configurations are just working the same way. Um, so you have the FPGA region that represents a physical region within the reconfigurable device. And um, this one is configured from, uh, by the user. Here, as mentioned, we have the device tree overlays. Um, the FPGA manager over here uh, manages the, the uh, association of which firmware, or in this case, bitstream actually, is loaded. And that's also leveraging the standard uh, Linux interface structure for uh, firmware loadings. That's the same device that's, uh, system that's also used by USB systems, for example. Then the FPGA bridge part decouples uh, every device specific things and uses the, the decouplers and the configuration access port. This port actually loads the firmware into the FPGA uh, config, configuration memory and the decoupler is associated with those little devices and uh, during the reconfiguration process that uh, decouples what is in the region from what is within, in the outside of the region because the behavior of logic within the region isn't specified during the reconfiguration process. Um, yeah, okay. So how do we actually trigger a reconfiguration and how to separate what, 
we want to uh, specify what goes in there, like parameters, um, platform drivers, or <laughs> the bitstream itself. That's done via um, the device tree overlay. So every region that is within the FPGA has a stub present representation in the overall system device tree. And uh, by loading this overlay onto this addresses, the actual process of reconfiguration is triggered. So we put the device tree overlay loaded into the de currently present device tree that triggers the reconfiguration process, which is shown in the next slide. And the AES bitstream is configured into the FPGA, and afterwards the driver is loaded and the system is fully operational and can use the new hardware. So that's the, the, the process of um, reconfiguration. We have the configuration part and the yeah, deactivation, I would say. And um, it's a multiple of steps. The coloring, I come back to that later on. So uh, we start with loading the device tree overlay, as already presented. And uh, this triggers the, the bitstream loading uh, part, interacting with the firmware subsystem. And when the firmware is available, the devices are decoupled so to make the FPGA ready for reconfiguration and uh, do not disturbing any other parts in the FPGA that's, that are keep on working. And um, then the actually done reconfiguration is executed that uses the um, program uh, and configuration access port and uh, loads the bitstream into the FPGA, which is actually one of the steps that contributes uh, a larger amount of time to the overall process. Afterwards, if this configuration is completed, the uh, region is coupled again, so that from this point on, the hardware can be accessed that has just been loaded into the FPGA. And after that, the, the change that has just been done to the hardware needs to be reflected into the device tree so that all other systems now know and are aware about this new hardware. So this is the application of the device tree overlay. After that, all the other subsystems that might be uh, involved and, and might use this new hardware now get um, triggered. So the driver is loaded that is specific to this new hardware and all the subsystems are in initialized like in our case, um, the support for the crypto API. Um, then the system is ready, it can be used. Um, that's this cycle that's usually people are interested in. Um, but as you have reconfigurable systems, you, all, you also want to know how fast can I reconfigure a system? How long is my, let's say, dead time in, in case I, I cannot actually use the resources I have within the system? because they are bound within this process here. And that's why we started to have a closer look at it, which steps are executed and which take how long. And um, that's coming later on then. So let's say the, the execution phase ends at some time. You have encrypted your file or whatever you have been done. And um, then you go on, you want to reuse this uh, region, you want to put another um, algorithm into the device, um, you, the, un, the, the platform driver is unloaded, the DTO, the device tree overlay, is uh, un removed from the currently present device tree, and um, the region is decoupled again from the system. So after this step, we are ready again, and the, the complete process can start all over again. Let's come to some of the results that we obtained during measuring the system. Um, so as there are a couple of steps involved with drivers from the uh, chip vendor and also some uh, more subsystems within the kernel, um, we used F-Trace to gather information about when functions were entered and exit during the overall process. Um, then, originally, the intention was to show or to see what, what the performance of our accelerator was, but um, 
then we discovered about this interesting process and uh, now we present this, this results because they are more general, interesting than our specific ones. And uh, yeah, we used F-Trace for this. Um, our bitstream size, so the, the size of our accelerator was um, almost six megabits, megabyte, that have been loaded into the FPGA. And um, this overall process, so all of that um, were take, took about 135 milliseconds. And um, so you see if you want to change the encryption algorithm for your hardware accelerator to, I don't know, encrypt one email and then another one for another email, you see that probably doesn't lead to a very efficient system because you spend more time reconfiguring it than ex actually computing. Um, an interesting part was to, to, uh, to see that the, the uh, second largest contributor to the overall time is actually loading the bitstream, and that doesn't involve the FPGA anyway. So it's just fetching the bitstream. That can be accelerated, but let's, uh, let's back, come back to that later. So that was what we originally also thought about was the main common contributor, that's the actual configuration process itself, that's the time needed to transport the bitstream from the RAM to the configuration memory on the FPGA through various um, interconnect uh, connectivity interfaces on, on, the, on the chip. And the third largest uh, contributor is the driver itself. So, um, that's also interesting as this is not a part of the framework. So anybody who implements drivers for reconfigurable systems should think about the setup times for them. The good news is only 1% of the overall time is spent within the FPGA framework on everything else that we haven't covered in, in this slide. So the framework itself seems to be quite well implemented with less overhead and um, shows good performance. And that also leads to the next uh, slide as we see performance bottlenecks, uh, especially with respect to the FPGA reconfiguration interface. Um, that's nothing we can change about as the FPGA vendors have to support that. Um, also, some issues within the fabric um, are root causes for that, so that communication with the reconfiguration access port is actually a bit slower than it should be. Um, the firmware caching itself has not yet been used in, in the system, so that's, that, could, that can be implemented within the um, FPGA framework in the kernel that currently does not leverage the, the caching mechanism, which is already built in to the firmware subsystem. Yeah, additional components that have traditionally built uh, into reconfigurable system supports um, are schedulers and governors or whatever other things are needed to make an efficient use of um, the hardware that has just been enabled. That's hopefully intentionally left out of the scope of the FPGA manager as um, that's very use case specific and we can implement it in user space anyway. Um, yeah, using device tree overlays uses interfaces that are more or less stable currently. It has, they have been in, um, developed for supporting shields and modular embedded systems like the Raspberry Pis out there. And um, we just reuse them for reconfigurable systems and that works quite well for now. What would be an interesting part is getting automatically, automatically generated device tree overlay from the vendor tools, as they usually do generate general drivers for um, hardware parts that have been created. Some of the mappings like addresses or uh, offsets and such things are known to those tools, so that could actually help while with using those um, approach. And to get to the, our last slide, it is 
a good reconfigurable system and um, we can use it. It efficiently supports using reconfigurable systems and um, the reconfiguration times are quite slow, uh, fast, but uh, the overhead is low and we can efficiently develop heterogeneous systems by them because of we don't need reboots if you change our hardware. This is a traditional problem. Um, so you get fast test cycles, you have um, a comp uh, compatibility layer for static and reconfigurable systems, so that's not especially needed to reconfigure, but it can also be used to static systems. Let's conclude. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>